Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at an MG42. I'm sure most of you guys recognize this. It's a standard and iconic German machine gun from World War II. And this is a very early version. In fact, we'll touch on this in a moment, but this gun was in service before it was formally adopted, this particular one. So, if we were to explore where the MG42 came from, the story really starts in 1935. It starts when the MG34 starts getting into the hands of troops on a regular basis. They're in production and they're actually getting issued out. The, the MG34 isn't perfect in service. It has some reliability issues, and perhaps more importantly, it is an expensive and time-consuming gun to manufacture, and the Wehrmacht isn't able to get MG34s as quickly as it would really like to. So the decision is made that instead of trying to iterate on the MG34 to fix some of its nagging little issues, instead they want to have an entirely new pattern of gun, and they specifically are interested in it being made of stamped, uh, largely stamped components. This is not just because that will make it quicker and cheaper to manufacture, it also means they can minimize the number of quasi-exotic alloys that they need. Germany doesn't have a good domestic source of alloying elements like nickel and manganese and vanadium, and a milled machine gun uh, like the MG34, largely milled components, requires a lot of fancy alloy steels in order to work effectively. With stamp steel you can get the same end result by using pretty much just simple low carbon steels. You don't need any fancy alloys. And that's what uh, the German military was specifically thinking about when they commissioned the MG34. Now, they recognized that stamping wasn't something that was in common use with the arms industry at that point. We think of Germany World War II as all a bunch of stamped guns, but this was kind of the first major one that would be produced. And so in looking for a company to develop the new gun, they actually kind of went outside the box and started talking to companies that were not traditionally arms manufacturers. So in particular, three companies were asked in 1937 to produce prototypes of a new machine gun under, you know, using these characteristics. They didn't really care how it locked or how it operated, as long as it was largely stamped components. So the three companies were, by the way, Rheinmetall, uh, a company called Stubgen, I'm probably mispronouncing that, and also a company called Grossfuss, which I'm probably also mispronouncing, named after its owner. Uh, Grossfuss specifically was not an arms company, they had never manufactured weapons. Uh, they were primarily a tooling manufacturer, they made machines, um, you know, manufacturing machines. They had an engineer by the name of Werner Gruner who would uh, take on this project, and he ended up getting the winning design. Gruner had, didn't even have army experience himself, he was a total novice. Uh, kind of makes you think of perhaps Gaston Glock. But he came up with an idea for a roller-locked recoil-operated machine gun with a largely stamped sheet metal receiver. Uh, the other two uh, competitors for what would become the MG42 were both gas-operated guns, interestingly. And in an April 1938 trial between all three, the Grossfuss design won out. So it would take about three more years, really four more years, almost five years, of further development. Uh, it would go through troop trials as the MG39, a prototype experimental gun. Um, at that point the rate of fire was only about a little over a thousand rounds per minute. And one of the primary characteristics of the MG42, of course, is that it has a very high rate of fire. 1500 to 1600 rounds per minute was standard in German service, and that was something that was specifically being sought by the German military. So one of the changes that they made to the MG39 was to tweak some of the bolt design elements, and we'll look at those in a minute, uh, to up the rate of fire to 15 or 1600 rounds a minute. Um, it would continue to go through development and refinement. In 1941 there would be a further set of field trials on what was at this point known as the MG39-41. Uh, it was formally presented to Hitler in December of 1941, and another 1500 were ordered for troop trials. And what's interesting though is the gun was not actually formally adopted by the Wehrmacht until October of 1943. And that is where my early comment about uh, this one being in service before it was adopted comes from, because by the time the MG42 was actually formally adopted, there were many thousands of them already in service. 
Uh, production began in 1942. There are 1942 and 1943 dated guns before they go to a series of date codes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, in fact, why don't we go ahead and take a close look at the gun now. I'll show you those markings and also how it actually works. All right, let's start with the markings here on the back left of the receiver. Uh, these guns were actually dated in 1942 and early 1943. After that, uh, all the factories would transition over to a two-letter date code system so that captured guns couldn't be used to figure out how much production was actually going on. Um, so this is a very early uh, pattern here. Uh, they are actually labeled MG42. There's your serial number. After these guns, after you hit 9999, a suffix would be added. So this is in fact only the 2404th MG42 manufactured by the Gutloff company and that is their three-letter production code. MG42s would be made, well, they are marked from five different factories. Those would be Gustloff, Steyr, uh, Mauser Borsigwald, and a company called uh, Magay, which is a, a subsidiary of Rheinmetall, so consider it Rheinmetall. Uh, Grossfuss, the company that actually developed the gun, would manufacture a lot of parts, and they did manufacture receivers, and so you will find receivers that have Grossfuss code markings, but they didn't appear to actually assemble any of the guns. They just supplied parts to the other companies, which maybe makes sense. The other companies were actually gun companies and perhaps had a better handle on the final assembly, testing and proofing and all that sort of stuff. Now there are a number of features on here that are indicative of this being a very early gun, and the most distinctive one is the charging handle here. The early pattern guns, basically up until October of 43 when they were formally adopted, um, the early pattern guns will have this horizontal charging handle. The problem is this is, for one thing, sticking way out from the gun and it's prone to get caught on things and break, and it also doesn't give you any real leverage. It's just a you know, this is a roller-locked gun. If you think about um, the stiffness of the charging handle on a typical HK, that's similar to this, and, and unlocking the 42 with this horizontal handle requires a really stiff yank on the handle. Um, so very early on they would replace this with a cammed style of charging handle that was a lot easier to use in practice. We also have a number of distinctive features of the receiver, things like these plates, uh, which would become more crudely welded on later. This uh, machining on the very end of the receiver is distinctively very early, as is the front sight. That front sight with the screw here is both windage and elevation adjustable, and that would be replaced by a much simpler front sight before very long. The very first MG42s, including this one, uh, were issued with Bakelite buttstocks. Those proved to be a little too fragile in practice in the field, so they were replaced by wooden buttstocks. This is an early replacement wooden buttstock. Uh, these were also too fragile. In fact, you can even see that this one is cracking right there. And so these were replaced by a reinforced pattern that has wire wrapping back here. Uh, this may not be, this isn't the stock that was originally issued on this gun, but it is a very early uh, German replacement stock. And then we also have aluminum grip panels on here, which is unusual and early. Those would be replaced by Bakelite. The feed system on the MG34 is a rather clever one. Uh, push this up and we can lift the top cover. What we have is a feed system here that actually divides the work into two parts. So the belt has to be pulled into the gun by these pawls. Of course that's typical of a machine gun. You have a stud here on the bolt that will run in this track in the top cover, and that translates forward and backward movement of the bolt into side-to-side -side movement of the feed system, which pulls the belt into the gun. What's cool about the MG42, and this would be copied on a lot of subsequent machine guns, is that it pulls the belt part way in as the bolt is going backwards, and the rest of the way as the bolt is going forwards. And this gives it a much smoother um, operating uh, rhythm than a gun like a Browning uh, that pulls that that does that all in um, the the rearward movement of the bolt. Also, by the way, the bits up here on the top cover are not spring-loaded, nor is the roller on the bolt. Uh, so if you are going to close the top cover with the bolt forward, you have to make sure manually that the feed tray is in this position. If the bolt back, then you move it to the other side. So we'll put that there. Uh, 
the bipod is reasonably well thought out here, uh, and this is this is actually a post-war bipod. The original uh, early MG42s had this stud on the bottom of the the receiver that would lock into a pair of little holes in the bottom of the bipod. The problem is that's really a finicky and overly complex way to go about locking the bipod. So uh, before too long, they replaced that with these simple sheet metal tabs, which just lock into the vent holes, or that particular vent hole, on the bottom of the receiver, like that. Now, as a universal machine gun intended to be capable of sustained fire, and one having a deliberately very high rate of fire, it's very important that the MG42 be able to have an easy system for changing barrels. And it in fact has a fantastic system for changing barrels. So I just have to lock the bolt back. Then we take this latch, push it forward, and what we have here is a sheet metal latch that comes down and is riveted onto the receiver there. And when I pull this out, it pops my barrel out. And then we can just pull it out like that. Uh, you can use any number of things to hook into this hole uh, in the barrel to pull it out, if it's too hot. All right, with the bolt forward and the spring uncompressed, I can then push this little spring-loaded latch on the bottom of the receiver. That allows me to rotate the stock, and it unlatches from the back of the receiver. So there's our stock. I can also take this out. That's actually the buffer assembly to reduce felt recoil a bit, and that's the buttstock itself. We have the recoil spring. Note that this is a three-wire uh, braided spring that uh, does a number of things that are nice. It means if one wire breaks, the spring still works. This reduces oscillation in the spring, uh, gives it an extended life. Really, the, the braided wire springs are a, a very important development, and you'll see them used on other guns in the future, most notably uh, AK fire control groups. Now I can use the charging handle here to pull the bolt back. There we go. There is our bolt assembly. And then I can pull the charging handle off, bring it back to here, and then lower it down and take it out. The fire control group on the MG42 is much simpler than the MG34. We have a cross bolt safety here, uh, but then the gun itself is full auto only. So you can see the sear down in there. Um, that's all you got, full auto. Um, the 34 attempted to have, a, well, did have a semi-auto setting that made the fire control group far more complex. Now, when I say that the MG42 had a stamped sheet metal receiver, this is true, but it is, I think, substantially more complicated than the stampings people think of typically today. We think of like the U-shaped receiver of an AK with, you know, two little rails welded in. Well, this has a lot of extra bits um, welded on the outside and the inside. There are guide rails in the receiver. There's a lot to it, but it was still far cheaper and easier to manufacture than an MG34's milled receiver. Mechanically, the way this works is actually a roller locking system. This was not patented by Gruner, um, but it, as far as anyone can tell, he actually didn't know about the patents. It was only patented in 1934, um, and Gruner came up with it independently, which is pretty cool. Um, it's, it's, you know, sometimes when you get someone thinking outside the box who hasn't worked in the industry before, they come up with a clever solution. So the idea is, uh, when the this is recoil operated, so when it fires, the whole thing is going to move back. I should say the bolt locks into the barrel extension here. So uh, kind of like the AR-15, which does the same thing, um, the force of firing is not really exerted on the receiver, and that's part of the reason they can get away with a sheet metal receiver. Uh, when this is locked in battery, these two rollers on either side uh, push out and are locked into this barrel extension right here and here. The barrel extensions, by the way, are extremely hard. Uh, when the gun cycles backwards, these rollers are able to reciprocate into the center of the bolt. There we go. And then the bolt can travel backwards independently of the barrel. So that's basic recoil operation right there. 
um, when the rollers are fully in, uh, in their inward position here, the firing pin can't protrude forward. When they go out, the firing pin does. This fires from an open bolt. Um, I can actually take this apart a bit more. Let's see. We can rotate that around. We can pull that out, pull that out. There's your firing pin. Just a little small thing that sits in this locking wedge. And there is the bolt head. Extractor on the top, ejector on the bottom. This plunger uh, actually is the ejector, so that goes forward. What this means is when the bolt goes back this will hit a stop in the receiver, which punches the ejector forward, kicks the cartridge out the bottom of the receiver. These are your sear engagement surfaces, so that's what the trigger group is actually holding on. The stud back here is what operates the top cover, and then these are your de facto guide rails. This looks very crude because this is a forged part and there was simply no need to do any finishing to the center section here, so they left it in a raw forged state. Now the MG42 system isn't perfect, and one of the issues that it had, the most substantial issue that it had in service, was what was called bolt bounce. The idea being when this goes into battery it's going to hit, and then it's actually going to bounce open and closed very slightly and very quickly. And these rollers will come in and back out a couple of times. And if you get the right combination of the bolt bouncing far enough, the rollers coming far enough in, and the firing of the cartridge being delayed enough, and we're talking like four to eight milliseconds, this can result in the gun firing while the rollers are not actually engaged in the barrel extension, and that causes the gun to basically explode. Now in German service this was a recognized issue, but doesn't appear to have been a particularly huge issue. Um, they spent time all the way through basically the end of the war trying to fix it. Um, best indications I've seen, uh, primarily from an author by the name of Folke Mervang, who wrote the definitive book on the MG42 and 34, is that German use of steel cased ammunition during World War II kind of mitigated these issues because the steel cases had a stronger, were stronger than brass, and they could survive being slightly out of battery uh, without rupturing upon firing. Uh, in the recreational historical collector shooting circuit, um, Every, it is not recommended that you fire an MG42 in original German World War II configuration. After the war, uh, countries who used these guns would develop a bolt bounce stop, um, basically a spring that was added to the bolt that would prevent these issues. Uh, and it's very easy to retrofit that into the gun, and very highly recommended if you have a World War II MG42 that you want to shoot. You get a spare bolt uh, in post-war configuration, drop it in, there's no permanent change to the gun and it just makes the gun a lot safer. I want to cover just briefly the rate of fire. These had a very high rate of fire, 1500 to 1600 rounds per minute. This was considered a good thing by the German military who specifically requested it, and they saw a couple benefits to this. Uh, I think primarily was you are less likely to get return fire if you are attempting to suppress an enemy position with what is 25 rounds per second. Uh, they, in the training manuals, they compare this out. Uh, the MG08s fired 7 rounds per second, the MG34s fired 15 rounds per second, and the MG42 fired a whopping 25 rounds per second. And the idea was, if the enemy position is receiving that volume of fire, they're going to be a lot less able to put their head up and return fire. And that makes the gun more effective. In addition, there were a couple ancillary benefits. It was deemed easier to see where you were hitting based on you know, dust and dirt kicked up by bullet impacts, because of course at 1500 rounds a minute there's a lot more of that happening uh, for you to see. And a very dense cone of fire like that uh, makes the gun more effective when you're attempting to spread fire across a, a wider area. You swing the gun across say a bunch of brush, or a hedgerow, or a, you know, a large enemy formation, you're going to get a much higher density of bullets on your target than if it was firing at a slower rate. Of course we also have our rear sight here. You can flip down the, the sight, and there's also an anti-aircraft sight. There is a little socket out here for the spider front part of the anti-aircraft sight. They'd stop uh, putting these on at the end of the war, or at least guns at the end of the war stopped having them 
if they were you know, not put on or removed by soldiers, but that's what that is. Anyway, the downside of course to this high rate of fire is that you have to carry a tremendous amount of ammunition uh, in order to keep the gun running, so that was the downside. The MG42 would prove to be a pretty darn popular gun in German service. It was well liked by the troops. Uh, it was the same weight as the MG34, virtually the same, uh, but it had more open clearances, it required less maintenance, and it was just more li less finicky and more likely to run without any problems. Now the MG34 would remain in production throughout the war, largely for use in armoured vehicles. Uh, all of the mounting points for machine guns in tanks and armoured cars and bunker fortifications, those had all been designed around the barrel change mechanism of the MG34, and redesigning all of that stuff to fit a different machine gun didn't make sense. So the 34 stayed in limited production for those applications, the 42 became the primary infantry machine gun. And in this way it filled the same universal machine gun role as the 34, but in a slightly narrower scope. So if you haven't seen my video on the 34, I suggest you take a look at it. We go into the universal machine gun concept there. In effect, you kind of lose out on the vehicular mounted aspect. There would be some anti-aircraft use of these, but not quite as much as had been originally intended with the 34. This was primarily going to be an infantry light machine gun and an infantry heavy machine gun. In the light role it was configured much like you see it here on a bipod, and then there was a version of the Lafette, uh, very intricate and uh, very complex and very effective uh, quadrupod mount or tripod mount uh, that allowed it to be used in a sustained fire role, indirect fire if you liked, um, but very stable, accurate at long range. In total about 400,000 of these were manufactured during the war. Um, remarkably more than half of them were made in 1944. Uh, production of small arms in Germany in general tended to go up right through to about the beginning of 1945, um, before strategic bombing and all of the other problems that Germany was having uh, started to really have a discernible impact on actual production totals. So um, as I said at the beginning this is a very early example, most likely captured in North Africa. Um, Rommel found out about these guns relatively early, was a big fan, and made sure that the Africa Corps got a bunch of MG42s. So that's probably where this one comes from. Obviously, I said this was a popular gun, but obviously it was popular because it is still in use effectively today. Uh, the MG42 was, only had to undergo minor modifications to uh, be rechambered for the 7.62 NATO cartridge, uh, and it would be used by the Bundeswehr, the German army in the 1950s, for a very long time and it was adopted by a wide variety of other countries as well, because it is fundamentally just a really good machine gun. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, hopefully you learned something about the MG42 and its implementation today. Thanks for watching.